the heart of my home is the kitchen. And it's here that I love to cook delicious meals for my nearest and dearest. There's no better way to celebrate everything good in life than sharing some great food with the people you love. These are the dishes that I cook when I want to bring people together. These are my home comforts. Time can be tight and our lives are busy, so it's hard to resist the fast, convenient food that's available all around us. But there was no such thing as street food when I was a kid. We just stuffed the car with grub to eat on the go. Whether you're planning a picnic or taking off for the weekend, there's always room in the boot for some home-cooked food that you can enjoy when you arrive. With just a little forward planning, you can have a fridge full of food that's always ready to eat on the hoof. So today, I'll be whizzing up a mobile Moroccan feast. I love tagines. It's that sweetness, that honey, the fruit. It makes it taste fantastic. Sharing the joys of eating al fresco with my mate, Chris Tarrant. I reckon in about five, ten minutes, that'll be ready. In the meantime, we just sit here <laughs> hoping for the fire brigade. <laughs> and whipping up some deliciously gooey chocolate and cherry brownies. Forget biscuits, this has got to be the ultimate grub on the go, hasn't it, really? I'm starting with a classic. My cheddar, smoked bacon and courgette quiche is perfect to pack up and eat on the run. Filled with an extra rich royale mix, it's served with a sneaky stay fresh salad that you can dress at your destination. The great thing about quiche for grub on the go is that they're portable, but also they're brilliant served at room temperature. It shouldn't be served straight out of the fridge. It's very cold and doesn't taste very nice. But the key to a really good quiche comes from the filling, but also the pastry. Now, I learnt the pastry from America. In America, they're massively into their bacon. In one particular part of the States, on the East Coast, this is where I learnt how to make the best apple pie in the world. And one of the things that they did, and I've done this since I've come back, is freeze or chill the flour. It's a really good idea for this. But this is a short crust pastry. And by chilling the flour and chilling the butter, you get a really short pastry, a nice fine pastry. And always for this, make it by hand. Rub the butter together with the end of your fingers, and that's where you keep the butter nice and cold. Take your time doing this. If you make it by machine, it toughens up the flour and as you bake it, it then shrinks. Keep rubbing the 250 grams of flour with the 150 grams of butter till the mix resembles fine breadcrumbs. Then add a pinch of salt and one whole egg. Now, you could, if you wanted to, allow this to just chill in the fridge. I'm probably going to roll this out straight away because this looks pretty good to me. Use a floured surface and keep rolling your pastry till it's thin. You know when it's ready, when you can read a newspaper through it, ideally. And I learnt this when I was training in France. There was a French chef that used to shout at me from the main kitchen, going, Mais non, la tartlette, la martine! La stupid French, but he swore at me in French. Um, but the idea is you've got to get this as thin as possible. Now, don't worry at this point, we're going to make it thinner in our mould. To do that, you take your little non-stick tartlet rings, like that, and just cut round. You can just go roughly around here, like that. Too many times people make quiches too thick a pastry and it doesn't taste very nice at all. Carefully press these thin pastry circles into the tins and use a knife to trim off any excess. Then pop them into the fridge to chill while you make your filling. First of all, we're going to basically dry fry a little bit of this dry cured streaky bacon, about four slices will be enough, just to get it nice and crisp. Now, if you can use a variety of different fillings, of course, for a quiche, I'm going to use some bacon, courgettes, a little bit of fresh thyme, but then make a royale mix. And the royale mix is really special, I think. Generally, quiches are made with just milk and whole eggs, but if you make it with egg yolks and cream, you get this lovely, rich interior to your quiche. Once you combine the cream and the egg yolks, season with some salt and pepper. Dice a small courgette, grate some mature cheddar cheese, and take the crispy bacon off the heat 
but don't wash the pan just yet. Now, it'd be a shame to waste this. It's the fat from the bacon, because this is lovely flavour. Now slice your bacon into strips and chop up some thyme. These three ingredients are going to work so well together. But of course, you can fill it with whatever you want. I like to put a little bit of cheese in the bottom first. Otherwise, if you put the cheese on the top, it covers up the filling. Now fill it properly full. Look, a key should be for life, not just for wedding buffets. That's how a key should be, really. I hate wedding buffets. The quiches will need 15 to 20 minutes in a low oven until they're golden brown and the filling is just set. Now I'm going to serve this with a salad. Now, the difficulty with a salad and a salad dressing when you're out and about is to dress it. Well, this is a good idea and a good tip. Now I'm going to use some grain mustard to make a little dressing, first of all. To do that, stick it in a little jar. You want about a teaspoon of your grain mustard, about a teaspoon of red wine vinegar, and then some oil. Now, I like using this rapeseed oil because of its flavour. And really, you want three to one. So, one part vinegar, three parts oil. Now, a pinch of salt, a little bit of black pepper, and give it a quick shake. And by putting it into a little jar like this, you can take it with you. So, after about 20 minutes, you end up with these. Lovely quiches, nice and warm. Just delicious. Your quiches and your dressing are good to go. Now it's time to put some of your favourite leaves in a zip-tight bag for a smart salad that can be finished on arrival. When you get to wherever you're going to go, open up your dressing, pour this onto your salad, keep some of the dressing for later, seal the bag up, and just shake the salad. Make sure all the leaves are combined with the dressing. There you have some nice dressed salad out of a bag without you washing up. Which is a good idea, I think. And then, of course, these delicious quiches. Quiches always should be served at room temperature. This is why it's great if you're out and about. This is delicious. It's the egg yolks and the cream that really enrich it. This doesn't taste anything like the stuff you get at christenings, weddings and funerals. Who'd have thought food on the go could taste this good? A salad in a bag. These luxurious quiches, with their buttery rich pastry cases and silky royal fillings, will brighten up any picnic or packed lunch, whatever the weather. A quiche is a timeless classic that you can bring back up to date by adding new and interesting fillings. It's really important to take a fresh look at foods that have been around for a while. And a new and exciting band of UK food producers are doing exactly that. Cotswold farmer Lizzie Dyer and her partner Jamie want UK diners to give goat meat a go. Lizzie's been the driving force behind their fledgling business but it took a few years to get the idea off the ground. <laughs> I would say I've definitely been interested in goats and kids for a long time. I mean, friends will say that I've been talking about doing this for years and years. <laughs> I was very lucky when I finished my A-levels, I went travelling with a friend, and in India in particular, we, we ate a lot of goat. So I think that did definitely spark it. And also, I suppose, when you're travelling, it always gives you time to reflect on what you'd like to do, and you come up with harebrained ideas, which some years later you actually see through. It turned out that Lizzie's idea wasn't so harebrained after all. Goat is actually the world's most popular meat, which explains why their global population is around a billion. But here in the UK, we're only just beginning to appreciate this tasty and plentiful meat. To start her business, Lizzie needed a farm. That's when she arrived in smallholder Jamie's life. Lizzie popped to the farm one day looking for some tap grazing for a unique endeavour. Before he knew it, um, I arrived with 20 kids. 20 kids? Most men would run a mile, but not Jamie, as the business relationship soon turned into a romantic one. 
very much business to start with, but um, no, we, we, we crossed the line. And so, no, we're very happy here. We both live here together and we're building our house. <laughs> he didn't know what he was letting himself in for. Those 20 goats are now 130, but not one of them is female. Lizzie buys her newborn billies from goat dairy farms. They can't produce milk, so they're no use to the dairy farm, and they would usually be dispatched at birth. It's a responsibility to really, in my mind, to, to find a use for them. Once I sort of was more aware of what was happening, I was quite impassioned, if that's the right word, to, to do it. It seemed logical. We're very lucky. We work with a local dairy farmer, and this year we should be taking all of his billies that are born, and he's really thrilled to be in that position where, at last, he's found a use for them. The new billies have to undergo a weekly weigh-in. Yep. These will be on the milk until they reach a certain weight. Looking at the weights we've got, most of them are, are pretty well there. 28.34. Some are a little shyer about sharing their weight than others. Oh. Once they reach the correct weight that we're looking for, the milk's taken away. So then they're just on the, the hay and the grass until they're ready to finish. 28.43. Most of the goat eaten in UK restaurants comes from France, but Lizzie is looking for a wider audience for her British kids. We made a decision early on that we wanted to sell to the public and to restaurants, which is quite unique because often you specialise in one area, but I thought it was nice to offer the public the product just as well as the chefs. Pretty well all the cuts you can get from lamb, you can also get from kid. You've got the shanks, then you've got things like diced, mince. It really is a, a meat that can fit into what we all eat every day now anyway. But not all this wonderful meat leaves the farm. As a former chef, Jamie's preparing a barbecue for friends and family with some goat dishes that are perfect for alfresco dining. This is a pulled loin, so this will just go straight into pita breads with a bit of salad. It's really simple, really nice, really easy. As you can see, it just breaks apart. After trading for less than a year, Lizzie and Jamie's kid meat has won two great taste awards. Good news for the guests. Really, really good. I thought it would be like a really rich meat, but it's quite subtle actually. We can do some well done if there's Neanderthals here. <laughs> if you like lamb and you like beef, I'd say it's very, very similar and just got a lovely flavour, very subtle, gentle. And the kid meat has convinced a few brand new fans too. It's the first time I've tried it and I actually think it's, I prefer it more than beef. Seeing beef is my favourite meat. And even my little one who's with me today, he's. Uh, tried it for the first time himself as well, and uh, he's really enjoyed it. He's had his second hot dog with it as well. It's really good. The best satisfaction of the whole process is watching people eat it and enjoy it, and especially the kids as well. You know, that they'll, they'll try something a bit different, and if they will, then the adults have got no excuse. Lizzie's turned her dream of running a goat farm into a reality, and on the taste front, it looks as though Billy the Kid's a winner too. <laughs> Goat meat is becoming much more readily available in the UK, and it's the perfect ingredient for my next dish, guaranteed to liven up a midweek working lunchbox. It's my aromatic Moroccan tagine, a North African stew fragrant with spices and served with a delicious fruit and nut couscous. Now, stews are one of those dishes that actually, in my mind, get better when you reheat it, which makes it perfect for stuff that you can reheat in the office or when you're out and about. So I'm going to use this goat to make a lovely little tagine. I've got a combination of sort of shoulder and neck here, which is perfect for this sort of tagine. If you can't find goat, you could use lamb. But first of all, we're going to make our spice mix, because that's really the crucial part of this. So I'm going to use a selection of spices. This is a little bit of cumin. It's got a wonderful aromatic sort of flavour. Some turmeric, which will give it that lovely colour, something like that. And then one of the key things, I think, in a tagine is this stuff, rasa al hanout, which is a combination of different spices. Sometimes you see little rose petals in there. It's a wonderful aromatic sort of spice as well. A little bit of saffron. Mix it together just with a little bit of oil. We can just use some normal veg oil for this and then mix this into a nice little paste. 
Once mixed, add the goat meat to the marinade. While you chop some onions, garlic, chili, and grate some ginger. Now, I keep the skin on ginger for this bit, because if you grate it with the skin on the ginger, there's a natural heat that occurs in the skin from ginger, which makes it brilliant for this dish. Now, this recipe can be done with goat, like I'm using, but it can be done with lamb, chicken. It's great using chicken thighs for this as well, the spices of which can stay the same. And also, you can use fish with this. Things like salmon work really well together. One thing you have to do is cook it for a lot less. Heat some oil in a pan and fry the chopped ingredients until they soften. Then add the meat and cook until lightly browned. Now, one other spice that I'm going to add to this is some cinnamon. The best way to do that is just throw in a whole cinnamon stick so it's easier to fish out afterwards. Next, add a tin of tomatoes, some water and a squeeze of runny honey. Moroccan tagines are famous for their dried fruit, so I'm adding some chopped dried apricots. If you can't get hold of these, a handful of sultanas will work really well. You get this an amazing sweetness in this dish, which I love. But you can see how this combination of ingredients, you've got the meat, you've got the honey, all of which works so well together in one dish. Another great ingredient you can add to this are these. Preserved lemons. These are salted lemons. Quite sharp, really, but when they're chopped up and cooked out in this tagine, they taste fantastic. Cooking the tagine on a slow simmer for 45 minutes will give these sweet, salty and sour flavours time to blend together. And while they do, I can prepare the couscous. For this dish, I'm giving it a twist by toasting it in my favourite ingredient. Now, the thing about couscous is that it doesn't taste of much, really, but by toasting it in butter, you're already starting to increase the flavour in this as well. You just get it nicely toasted like that. I can see it's starting to puff up a little bit. You can see the little grains are nice and brown. Then, and only then, do you get some water. And you're just going to slightly cover it with water. Then, put the couscous in a bowl. Cover it with cling film for five minutes, and the residual heat and steam will cook it. Once you've fluffed it up with a fork, this dish is ready for some chunkier textures. That's why I like to use some pistachio nuts. I like to use some flaked almonds as well. These are just toasted flaked almonds. And then some pine nuts. I love pine nuts, not just for pesto, but they're great in this. And then again, some soft fruit. I'm going to use more of these apricots. And this is where you can put things like pomegranate, even fresh raspberries through it as well. It's entirely up to you. In actual fact, this can actually be a dish on its own if you add things like feta cheese to it as well, a little bit of cooked chicken. And then not forgetting, we've got these lovely preserved lemons, which are very, very sharp, real smack of flavour. So when you're doing this, you need to chop these quite small. Mix the chopped fruit and nuts into the couscous, along with a generous handful of freshly chopped mint, parsley and coriander. I'm going to finish this, although it's got some preserved lemons in there as well, I'm going to finish it with a good squeeze of lemon juice. Don't worry about the pips. People will call those pine nuts. Now, the great thing about this, it reheats really well. You can serve it cold, room temperature, or you can warm it up in a microwave. Now, to finish off this tagine, we can take our cinnamon stick out, and then we carry on the influence of what we've done with our couscous. We can add some pistachio nuts to this and then some of the herbs. Exactly the same herbs that we've got in our couscous. A final season with some salt and pepper and my fragrant goat tagine is now ready. Mmm. I love tagines. It's that sweetness, that honey, the fruit, it lends itself so well together with the goat and with the toasted couscous. It makes it taste fantastic. All the way from Morocco, this perfumed tagine is a feast of sweet and savoury flavours. The tender goat meat simply falls apart on the fork. Reheat this in the microwave at work and your colleagues will throw their sandwiches 
என்ன பேன் Moroccan flavors always remind me of the holidays that I've taken there. Jane Sanderson, an artisan food producer from Cornwall, returned from a rather extended break with a recipe for a healthy food that's perfect for people on the move. I first came across Duka years ago traveling through North Africa around Morocco and came across this amazing mix um in the in the markets of Morocco real mesmerizing smells and sounds going on and from then I was hooked amazing flavors and uh, I've been making it ever since Duka is a um, blend of toasted nuts spices and seeds which is all served as a dip so traditionally served with a nice fresh bread or a flat bread olive oil and dip into the duka even though duka's been catching on in other countries it's still pretty new in the uk but down in penzance this lot have been scoffing it for years i'd be making duka for friends and family basically is my lazy starter people coming round bread oil duka on the table that starters and dips done friends had always asked for sort of a an extra spare tub of duka to take home with them to use and so i i popped some in a tub took it to a local shop and within a week they were giving us a call asking for some more which we were chuffed to bits with hugely surprised and it's all grown from there since she supplied that batch to a local shop jane's range has expanded and she now makes four different blends but they're all based on the same recipe this is our super duka so we start off with a base of toasted nuts almonds hazelnut and also super seeds in there so we have pumpkin sunflower poppy and sesame seed there's a huge amount of nutrition with these super seeds in there you've got a huge amount of omega 3 oils um so it it really packs a punch with uh, with nutrition and also the oils that you're eating it with as well and then with the spices that we put in we have coriander cumin cayenne and a sweet paprika black pepper and sea salt and also a good punch um from thyme and fennel in there as well to give it a nice depth and warmth of flavor all that's left to do is dry roast the spice and nut mixture in the pan as soon as you start toasting it through it just fills the kitchen with amazing smells and that fragrance can be traced back thousands of years Duka originates from Egypt. Um it was first eaten by the camel riders across the deserts. They're able to toast the nuts and the spices um in the evening over fires. It would mask the taste of the stale breads and also just provide them with a huge amount of nutrition with the amount of protein and the seeds and nuts. You can imagine the early desert riders together around the campfire and the great aromas coming off that. Duka may have been used for millennia as a simple bread dip. but as Jane's discovered it's way more versatile. Let the duka feast begin. Oh, wow, very nice. It can go into anything. So I cook with it an awful lot. It works brilliantly as a seasoning for meat and fish, so you can use it as a crust or you can use it as a rub for meat. We have it on salad and also just topping on some hummus as well. So it can go into anything. It kind of literally does in our house. do you start sort of tucking in you will find duke on absolutely everything yeah. <laughs> for those of us with a sweeter tooth there's even a duke for puddings our dessert duke has nice roasted pistachio nuts hazelnuts star anise cardamom vanilla gorgeous flavors in there which just go perfectly with fruit crumbles or even sprinkled onto ice cream one of the things that i'm trying to do is actually raise awareness of it in the uk at the duka revolution going um and uh, just make us as familiar with using it as as an amazing seasoning a really tasty dip and very simple dish <laughs> really exciting time for duka in the uh, in the uk i'm not sure duka will ever replace the cream i eat on my strawberries but then i am quite traditional i like puddings that are rich and indulgent and this one is ideal to pack in a picnic hamper or simply grab when you're on the move it's my dark and white chocolate brownies filled with ripe dark cherries and the gooier they are the better now the key i think to having food 
for on the go is stuff that doesn't deteriorate even though it's not in the fridge. And brownies are really the prime example of this. If you put them in the fridge, I actually think they get worse because they get rock solid. They're much better off at room temperature. And this recipe is fantastic because we're going to use cherries, two different types of chocolate to go in it. It's a classic American recipe. So first thing we're going to do is line our mould. Now, the tin that I'm using is just a normal brownie tin. Just take a little bit of butter, first of all, and just pop it into the corners. And then grab some grease proof. And what you're looking for is about an inch all the way around the size of the tin. So when you tuck it inside, you don't get any overhang. Now, to stop the creases in the corners, cut at a 45 degree angle into the grease proof. So when you place the grease proof in the tin, it folds round nicely, so you don't get any sort of folded up bits of grease proof where all the mixture sticks to. With the tin prepared, I can turn my attention to what's going to fill it. And first I need to melt the dark chocolate using a glass bowl set over a pan of simmering hot water. Just bring it up to the boil and gently simmer it. The chocolate that I'm using, what you need to look for on the packets of chocolate is a cocoa solid percentage. And this is about sort of 60% really. And this is where I think the chocolate brownie made in the UK is a little bit better than over the Atlantic because the chocolate that they have over there is definitely not as good as ours. Add some unsalted cube butter to the chocolate, and while that gently melts, you can get on with the rest of the brownie mix. I actually think this next bit is really the crucial part. I'm going to use three large eggs for this. It's whipping up the eggs and the sugar, and the particular type of sugar that we use, the soft, dark brown sugar. A lot of the times, the recipes will tell you to use caster sugar. I think this is crucial, really. You get this lovely treacly taste to a brownie, but most importantly, you get this soft texture in the middle. And I think it's the sugar and the way that you whisk it up that causes that. Whip the eggs and the 250 grams of brown sugar together really well for at least five minutes until the mixture is light and fluffy. This will guarantee a fabulous gooey brownie centre. In the meantime, get on with the fruity filling. I'm going to fill this with some fresh cherries. We're just going to cut these in half. You can use sultanas for this as well. But I think the cherries work fantastically with the dark and the white chocolate. And also try not to cut them too small, otherwise they just sink to the bottom. You can save some of them for the top and some for the base. Which that looks pretty good to me. It almost wants to be sort of half whipped cream consistency. You're beating in loads and loads of air to this, but it's really that sugar that gives it that chewy sort of texture, which we all love, of course, in a chocolate brownie. Stir the melted butter and dark chocolate together and pour this onto the sugar and egg mixture. Add 110 grams of flour, baking powder, most of the cherries, and mix well with whatever you have to hand. I don't know why I'm mixing it with this. You've got these things on the end of your arm, which are quite handy for this. It mixes in so much faster. And we can just pour this straight onto your tin. Top with roughly chopped white chocolate chunks and the remaining cherries, and it's ready to pop into the oven. And the cooking of it is quite crucial. For about 25 minutes, something like that, Test it with a finger, make sure there's a little bit of bounce on the top, and then take it out immediately. You don't want to be overcooking these. They're going to be good. It may seem a long time to wait, but believe me, those 25 minutes are worth it. When the time's up, remove the dish from the oven and leave it to cool in the tin before dusting with a little cocoa powder. Now, the best thing with this, it gets better the longer you leave it. So even after a, a day or two, it starts to get even more sticky, which is exactly what you want. That's if it lasts that long. And the texture of it, you can see it's, it's soggy, but it's cooked. Forget biscuits, this has got to be the ultimate grub on the go, hasn't it, really? And it doesn't last very long. These brownies are a treat that can travel anywhere. Packed with rich chocolate and moist cherries, it's always advisable to grab one before you share them, because they won't hang about. 17th century life was slower than today, 
and without modern refrigeration techniques, eating on the go was harder. So our ancestors had to come up with some nifty solutions, as food historian Ivan Day is discovering at Townend Farm in Cumbria. Of all foods, meat and fish are the most difficult ones to keep fresh when they're being transported. Back in the 17th century, a lot of aristocrats had deer parks on their estates and they wanted to give gifts of venison to their friends in London. But how do you move meat and fish that distance when you've got just horse-drawn wagons and a few very slow-moving vessels? And they were sometimes sent on voyages of three or even 400 miles and arrived at their destination with no refrigeration, completely fresh. So I'm going to show you how this was achieved. Now you probably think of Cornwall immediately when you think of pasty. Well, forget it. This is a completely different sort of food. It's not so much a nice pastry to eat as pastry that is actually used as a packaging. The pastry was made of rye flour and water. It was tough and didn't crack, ideal for making an airtight parcel to stop bacteria from spoiling the meat and it was really effective, most of the time. It's a great method, but unfortunately, it sometimes didn't work. And there's a notable occasion when Samuel Pepys, the diarist, was given a pasty which had obviously decomposed. And he described this pasty as stinking like the devil. He obviously didn't enjoy it. So if the pastry wasn't foolproof, the cooks had to learn how to preserve the meat inside. The venison filling was carefully prepared by first making deep cuts into the meat before adding butter, pepper and ginger. The other important spice was nutmeg. The spices varied enormously according to whoever prepared it. But this is not just for flavour, it's also for preserving the meat. It's a rather important element. The final ingredient was another essential preservative, salt. So all we need to do now is to make our pastry parcel for sending off to Lord Fancy Pantsy down in wherever, you know, because he wants a venison pasty at his next works do. To make this high-class pasty, the pastry was folded over the meat and the sides were sealed with great care before the decoration was applied. These pasties were often ornamented because they had to look good. They're going on to a high status table, which is covered with all sorts of other decorative food. For instance, you might get a full stag in pastry on the pasty. In this particular case, it's ornamented with a couple of arrows, which are obviously related to, to hunting the animal. Although it's decorative, this does actually help to strengthen the crust of the pie as a sort of reinforcement structure when it's baking. With his ornamental arrows on target, Ivan makes a hole in the top of the pastry and then puts it in the oven for two to three hours. And while that's baking, I've just got one more task to do, and that is to make some clarified butter. Well, that technique hasn't changed over the years. Simply bring the butter to the boil, then strain out the impurities. 17th century chefs would pour this liquid into the cool pie. Once set, it helped preserve the meat inside. You could, if this was well made, keep it in a larder for a very long time. I've done an experiment myself, and I've kept one of these with venison in it for three months. Three months? Now that's preservation. The pasty Ivan's just prepared isn't that old, so hopefully it will taste terrific. That's the best thing I've eaten this week, without a doubt. It's sweet, really tender, just melts in the mouth, and it's really tasty too because of all the spices. For me, this is the ultimate grub on the go. That armour-plated mobile meal has given me an idea. I've invited my old mate, TV and radio presenter Chris Tarrant, who's a keen angler, to come and fish my local pond. Hello, James buddy. Martin. How are you doing? Oh, good. Good to see you, mate. Good. Good to see you. Come, come on, on in. And I have a plan for the perfect pack lunch to take with us as we while away a few hours by the water. It's my barbecued tin serrano, mozzarella and pesto sandwich. This is nice, isn't it? Welcome to the kitchen. 
This is a kitchen. This is a kitchen. I've yeah. heard about these. <laughs> Apparently, I've got one in my house. Have you ever made your own bread before? Uh, yes, years ago when I was in the Scouts. Really? Yes. So, did you get your Scout badge for cooking then? No. No, you didn't. You were failed. Right. Well, I'm going to show yeah, you. I'm going to show you an old-fashioned recipe. Okay. Right? That's me. Right you're straight. Okay. Yeah. Do you like sourdough? Yes. It's a flour, semolina. Semolina. It's semolina flour. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. It's, it's called a. Just. Just hang with me. It's all moment, right. Chris. Hang with me at the moment, Chris. Right. This is called a starter. Sourdough breads use a fermented batter like starter filled with naturally occurring wild yeasts and bacteria to make them rise. We don't have time to make one from scratch today, so I'm making a fast one using live yeast, which means I can keep an eye on Chris in the kitchen. Now we want some sugar. Of course we do. Which is the white stuff over there. Where? Oh, there. There, right in front of you. It says caster sugar on. Now, the reason why we add sugar... Is to make it sweet. No, it's, no. To, it's to feed the yeast, because the yeast is a living thing. It's not one of my strengths cooking, you know that. I've heard about this. So, how did you start in radio, then? I did it the other way around. I did yeah. years and years of TV before you were even born. You did tis once, didn't you? I did tis once. We have got something in common, a Saturday morning show, haven't we, really? Mine was a sort of legendary cult show, and yours is... The longest-running Saturday morning show ever. Just a bit of cooking. It's not like a proper job, is it? <laughs> yeah. Mine was more an art form. Oh, was it? OK. It's <laughs> making children cry. So you didn't do... Rolling about in custard. <laughs> Once you've mixed the dough, set it aside for 30 minutes and the yeast will work its magic. Now, check that out. If you smell that, it smells like the best beer you'll ever have. Smell. Oh, do you know that smells like the best beer I've ever had? Good, isn't it? That's extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> you put a bottle of beer under my nose. No, I did. You <laughs> did. Well, my eyes were shut. It is good, though, isn't it? Uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to turn this into bread. So we're going to stick all that... And all this is just take fishing? Yeah. yeah. Bread just doesn't come from a shop. Somebody has actually got to make it, Chris. Well, yeah, I just go down the garage. So what do you have when you go... Cos you're a massive fisherman, we're going to take... Scotch egg. Is that it? Scotch egg or pickled onions, occasionally both, and a bottle of wine. Top wet. But that's, that's warm in your pocket, a warm Scotch egg in your pocket, and you just well, munch... My man, my man Howard carries everything. Oh, you have a carrier, do you? <laughs> my fishing mate. <laughs> He's sort of pack mule. To your starter, add more white flour, some semolina flour, a pinch of salt, and pour in some warm water. You are now actually in the presence of making bread. If I get you to pour that in, you're actually making bread. Am I? Yeah, go on then. There you go. God. There you go. You're now officially, you can say you've made a bread loaf. It's not a proper job, is it? <laughs> Isn't it? I don't mean that in an unkind way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that in an unkind way. It's a good way. job with mates, are we? Yes. <laughs> That's a serious bit of kid, isn't it? Well, it's just, you know, it's just a mixing bowl. I'm sure you've got one of these in your kitchen somewhere. I probably have. It's probably got dust on it or something. Like <laughs> <laughs> Once the dough has come together, let it rest and rise again for another half an hour. Cut it into two, and then we do something called knocking back, which means kneading it roughly for a few minutes until it's soft, smooth and elastic. What am I doing? Knocking it back? Yeah, knocking it back. No, you're supposed to do that what? first. Which? This, this, this first. No. Stop playing around with it like I'm that. Not... You seem to be sort of punching it a bit. <laughs> Look, I think mine might be better than yours, actually. Look at that. It's, it's different. See, I don't think there's much difference between mine and yours. It's clearly... You need to get your eyesight done. Look. Set your two rolls of dough aside for another half an hour before baking them in the oven for approximately 45 minutes. Now onto that classic Italian pesto sauce. Most people make it with just basil leaves, but I'm adding plenty of peppery rocket. Do I stuff it down here? Yes. OK. That's a technical cooking expression, stuffing it down. Yeah. What's supposed you can to do take it, the lid off if you well, want. I thought you were going to show me how to do that bit. <laughs> then you need to grate some Parmesan cheese in there. Of course I do. Just seeing which side <laughs> I use. <laughs> oh, it's all right for you, Mr Smarty. You wait till you get a fishing rod in your hand. Add lots of grated Parmesan to the basil and roquette, along with some pine nuts. Then drizzle in some extra virgin olive oil and blend to a thick consistency. This is where this... Sandwich becomes a little bit special, all right? Because we're going to bake this in a tin. Line the loaf tin with buttered tin foil. Then slice your now cool bread into thin slices. 
Then using the pesto, it's time to start assembling the sandwich with some wonderful Mediterranean ingredients. So you take a piece of bread, some rocket, pesto over the top, a chunk of mozzarella, and then you can start layering this up. Even you could do this, you see. No, because whatever I do, you will poo-hoo. That's perfect. Oh, is it? Yeah. It's perfect. Oh, OK. Couldn't have done it any better. Bet you could. <laughs> and then you take some serrano ham like that. And then continue layering this up. This is going be the biggest sandwich in the world, this thing. It's me and you. You know, we're growing right. fellas, aren't we? Will we? Be. It's like fishing, in it? It's quite therapeutic, don't you think? It's quite good. Yeah. This is a monster sandwich. Right now, this is the key to this, all right? Get our tin. Probably put a bit more cheese on it, why not? It's just a low-calorie dish, this yeah, thing. Yeah, costs a little more. It's going to sit in there. And then you take this bit and you stick this in there. But how can you tell where your one's going to end and mine starts? I can tell, and that's all that matters. I don't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> and then what we're going to do is we're going to look... Let's see, pop this over like that. And put it in the oven. No, we're going we're gonna to go fishing now. But it's not warm. No, it will be. It's it will be. How? So I've, I've, I've got something ready to warm this up. Take that. Thank you. Let's go fishing. But it's not warm. It will be in a minute. You don't know what you're doing. I know exactly what I'm doing, Chris. Well, when it comes to cooking, I do. This is it. That's my sandwich in there. That's it. We put the coals all around it. Now, I reckon in about five, ten minutes, that'll be ready. In the meantime, we just sit here <coughs> hoping for the fire brigade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While we're waiting for the sandwich to toast, we might as well have a little competition. And we're using some of the leftover sourdough as bait to see who gets the first bite. From the fish, that is. <laughs> oh, that's tea sorted. Master, look at oh, that. You, look at that. That would feed a family of 12. At least I caught something. Don't drop it in the fire and start to cook it, because you can't help yourself, can you? <laughs> that, God, that's... that's very nearly <laughs> two ounces. <laughs> Bless him. It's a good job I'm here, otherwise we'd go hungry. I'll just put it back then to grow bigger. Right, you ready for this sandwich? Uh, I'm starving. Sure that looks really see. succulent cheese, doesn't it? Looks good, doesn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah? It smells nice. I don't know how you eat it yet, but you said just sort of dive in. It won't be a pretty business, but it'll be very, very nice for us. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Hmm. So after all the toiling in the kitchen, mm -hmm. this is actually beautiful. It's nice, though, isn't it? It's lovely. It's like fishing, it's worth the wait. I hate to say this, but it is so much nicer than anything I've ever eaten when I'm fishing. Thank you. And I think I cook most of it. <laughs> Of course you did, Chris. But it just goes to show that with a bit of thought and planning, grub on the go needn't be second-class fare. These delicious recipes will ensure that you have first-class food wherever you are. Martin! Martin! Quick, quick look! It's bigger than yours. <laughs> it's not yours bigger than mine. That's good, isn't it? That one each. Look at that. That's a rud. Rud is a beautiful fish. But we don't cook them. <laughs> you can find all the recipes from the series at bbc.co.uk forward slash food. Mine was definitely bigger than yours. It's at least that big. Yeah, dream on. Lots of drama on offer tonight on BBC One. News about Charlie sends Stacey running. Don't miss two EastEnders episodes at 7.30 and 8.30. Between those, Composon has to deal with a love rival. Dickensian is at eight. Up next today, the Antics Road Trip.